Okay, uh, introducing Heron then. That is uh, the, the first part, of course, to start, to start with the, the acronym, clearly it's easy. It's uh, well, uniting heritage with landscape, and those are the two major concepts of Heron. We started already on the 1st of April 2019, that's almost half a year, more than half a year ago, and we will go on for four years. Uh, the PhDs are just starting right now. It is a collaboration of basically six universities. That is Gothenburg University, then Bezalel Academy of Fine Art, of, uh, sorry, yes, of Art and Design, Jerusalem, Romagret, University of Sudi, TU Delft, Technology University Delft, and Newcastle University. These are the basic six partners, the so called beneficiaries in EU terms. And then there are 16 private and public partners spread out of all of, 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 of Europe. The project is financed, I mean, we don't, don't you do this just on, on a Saturday <coughs> afternoon, we are being funded by the EU through a Horizon 2020 Marie Curie grant, and this is a specific call which is called International Trading Network, ITN. And it, it's a fantastic opportunity to bring 15 PhDs together, indeed, to work on a common theme. And that is indeed that of cultural heritage and the planning of European landscapes. Now, what are the major aims of this project? Here they are. First of all, research. Actually, it took us, when we prepared this, uh, this proposal, it took us some time to understand whether this course was about research or whether it was about training. But then, well, we, we understood that it's about both. And actually, uh, these are two central pillars in our project, research and training. First of all, to define and develop a new <coughs> European standard in cultural heritage management, embedded in spatial planning and design. It's ambition. Training to build a sustainable European training network on what we call heritage planning, uniting heritage and spatial planning. <coughs> and of course then, we do not want this to be a purely academic exercise, but to valorize what we do, that is to anchor it in academic, professional and governmental context throughout Europe. For instance, we've been just discussing a visit to the GRC, the Joint Research Centre, that is the knowledge hub of the European Commission and the intention is to visit them because we wish to disseminate what we're doing uh, at the level of the European Commission. So ambitious clearly, uh, but we're into it and, and I'll tell you what uh, the mission is about actually. The mission of Maryland operates within an ongoing paradigm change. It's not that we've invited this and invented this from the stretch just now. Of course, before us, Hank has already talked about it, there is a trend going on. Uh, it's a paradigm change in the field of heritage and spatial planning. It's a change which uh, started with criticism of traditional heritage perspective, of which this is maybe a good example. What are we seeing here? This is the so-called site of the Portico Semilla, not very well known, but uh, very well known to me, I've excavated this site. And what is typical is that it is behind bars. It is closed off physically and intellectually from the outside world, from social and spatial context, whatever. Why? Because this is national heritage, this is national Italian heritage, but I took this example because it's one of my own. But uh, there are many examples like this in the Netherlands and wherever in other countries in Europe. This is the traditional approach to heritage conservation, heritage conservation ethics. Conserving, restoring such sites for prosperity, for posterity, sorry, uh, for future generations. Now, again, this trend, this new paradigm started to criticize this, this approach and uh, the new heritage perspective instead has shifted its focus from the a localized monument to a concern for whole landscapes, urban, rural, marginal, 
including, for instance, industrial science like this <coughs> one. This in the center is the, the, uh, the gas plant of the so-called Westerhassebrief in Amsterdam. So what we're talking about is the new paradigm. It, it includes the tangible, but above all, also the intangible, the material world of memories, of memories, traditions, and mantle landscapes. It emphasizes that heritage can have a role as a resource. That's new, of course, not protection hiding it away, but a resource for regeneration, for a sustainable future. And one, I mean, you can do so, when it is integrated within a wider spatial and social context. So when the fences are being torn down. Uh, well, accordingly, that's what Hank was already talking about, planners, economists, policy makers, heritage managers, uh, but also local communities, civic society has slowly, has gradually started to see that the totality of the landscape, so we talk about the totality of the landscape, not even only the focus on a single industrial archaeological site, no, the totality of the landscape um, can be used to release social, cultural and economic capital. Of course, this sounds rhetoric, rhetorical, uh, but uh, there are many projects amongst others by the uh, Dutch Heritage Board having been started to find out how you do it. The new vision was partly codified by the Council of Europe in 2005 with the final convention, uh, which was anticipated by the European Landscape Convention in 2000, and uh, internationally beyond Europe, and it has been sustained strongly by the UNESCO recommendations on the historic urban landscape, which was drawn up in 2011. And we are lucky enough to have one of the, um, the major sustains of those who draw up the, the, the recommendations amongst us. Now, of course, uh, Harriland, uh, clearly Harriland partners have played a major role in these, in these developments. In, national context or an international context, like the UNESCO. Um, and they have now united their forces. That's what it is about, Aaron. They have now united their forces in a new consortium, trying to be proactive, to proactively now really push through this new paradigm. That's what it is about. Uh, notwithstanding this, of course, there are still well, some problems to solve. The state of the art is not completely linked up to the ideal yet. And that's what I'm going to look at now. What is that state of affairs in heritage management and, and how do we wish to go beyond? First of all, state of affairs one, protection, yes. In much of Europe, the focus is still very much on protection and closure, isolation. And this, I think I'm not going into details, don't throw waste, it's like in a zoo. This is how much archaeology and much heritage is still to be perceived. Now, I've already discussed this, uh, this traditional perspective. Uh, in line with what I've just discussed, Harriman aims to break through these answers. Actually, these are our major work packages. We position heritage within social and spatial dynamics. Those to which we think heritage can make a vital contribution. That is, first of all, the spatial term. Then we've got shifting demographies, contest identities, as we call them, changing environments, digital transformation, and democratization. With regard to the first, we investigate amongst others how heritage uh, how heritage indeed can be approached uh, from a holistic point of view, from a holistic landscape approach. And uh, well, that's one that I've just discussed, with a focus on planning, on large scale planning and designing space. So I think that is different from the, uh, the earlier approach that we discussed. As to the second, that is shifting demography, we investigate demography on how heritage values change with a multicultural society. 
at what problems this may be. And everybody can sense what a delicate issue this is. Third, with regard to changing environments, we study, amongst others, uh, how heritage can raise awareness of climate change. Or what consequences, I mean, we show here that's the Dutch corner, which uh, is the, well, this is going to be the future heritage image of the Netherlands. Not the wooden shoes and, and the traditional windmills anymore, of course. Our landscapes are changing quickly. And due to large scale global environmental change. That's important for you as investors. As to the fourth, that is digital transformation, we study the role of heritage in the digital age. For instance, well, much heritage um, is nowadays still place based because we still have the idea that there is physical space, that physical space and place are still issues, important issues. Well, of course, in the digital age, that will change. And everybody I think, knows what I mean with that. Finally, with regard to democratization, we ask, amongst others, how heritage can stimulate democratic values and citizen co-creation. If I may summarize the project, it is about heritage out of its comfort zone. Okay, that's the first state of affairs that we want to go beyond. The second one is that of disciplinary and sectoral boundaries. This is the Berlin Wall, and I showed this image also the other day <coughs> to explain to the team what we meant. I mean, this is still the state of affairs at universities between history departments, archaeology groups, uh, and for instance, architectures, architecture. And urban planning, economists, spatial economy, for instance. Uh, yes, we are trying to break through, but these boundaries still exist. The same goes for society. Similar sectors are not talking to each other. They're talking different languages. They're talking, they've got different visions about the future, about the past. That's very interesting, of course. And, uh, well, now, Hamlet explicitly aims to be inter and transdisciplinary in stack. We've got an entirely interdisciplinary team, PhDs, 15 PhDs, and senior researchers. And, and, and of course, through collective training in real life laboratories, amongst well, mostly at Rome and Newcastle, but there are many more smaller laboratories, we mean to stimulate this interdisciplinarity. Okay. The third gap yeah, is that between theory and practice, this quote of Einstein also goes for heritage and spatial plan. Theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Many new concepts indeed in the field of heritage and planning have been developed in the last decades. I just named a few. Uh, the historic landscape characterization at Newcastle. Here at Vue, much has been played with the landscape biography or the historic urban landscape also of UNESCO. Very valuable concept, uh, but Hamilton aims to evaluate them and develop methods and team and tools to operationalize them. Of course, I mean, others have already been doing, trying to do so, but we continue to do so. It is needed. Then, of course, this is a well, uh, a boundary which we all still know which the European Union wishes to wish to break down uh, that between countries, national entities and heritage management and training especially traditionally organized, not uh, of national. Of course, I mean, heritage, heritage has everything to do, of course, uh, they, it's perceived as a, as a pillar of national identity. Heritage is quite often claimed by national authorities to, of course, construct as a vital element to construct national identities. Well, Ireland, our project explicitly cherishes this. A transnational perspective that compares and questions national approaches. We do so 
of this, and not going into detail, don't be afraid, we do so through a detailed transnational and interdisciplinary training scheme, which has five work packages here. That is uh, on spatial terms to change the environment, and in each work pack there are three, uh, three PhDs working, and of course there are connections in between. And we've got three levels of training, uh, local, local host level, U, Jerusalem, down, uh, then there's interlocal, various universities working together, and then there's a network wide where we all come together to work on interdisciplinarity on specific assign, uh, assignments, planning and design assignments. So again, uh, I'm not going into detail. I think this is enough. Um, this is our scheme, actually, and uh, this is what Hannah stands for. And this was this training network that we wish to go beyond the state of affairs that I have just discussed. Now, in the rest of my talk, I wish to explore more in detail one of the specific contributions of Duke University to Harriman, that is on teaching, more specifically on critical reflection. And I will start with a recent lucid critical analysis <coughs> of Dutch heritage planning strategies and their theoretical, methodological, and practical underpinnings. It is called character sketches. Has to do with characterization, as Hank already explained, and it presents a national research agenda on heritage and spatial planning. It has been written under the wings of the National Heritage Board, and in this agenda, the authors uh, have classified that is the sector factor and the factor approach. The first is defined the sector approach, that is the traditional one that I've been uh, discussing already. That is uh, well, much like the older approach that I've uh, mentioned the emphasis is on heritage as a sector, a separate, isolated sector, and to keep isolated from the other sectors of society, from social and spatial development in general. Um, in the 1990s, instead, alternatives have been developed under the banner of the so called Belvedere uh, Memorandum. And they successfully managed to bridge the divide between heritage conservation and sustainable development. And in this approach, heritage is taken as one of the potential factors of development. Hence, it is called the factor approach. <coughs> so heritage, economy, social aspects, etc. is one of the factors. This approach is even a bit, it has been taken even further in the early 2000s, with a broadening of the concept of heritage covering now tangible as well as intangible assets and seen through the lens of landscape. In this holistic view, the historical dimension of landscape is key. It can inspire this historical dimension, and that is really important, uh, it can inspire landscape planning and supply it with context as a vector. That's why it's called vector. A case in point is the so-called Biography, the landscape biography, or life history approach, if you wish. The focus is on how a specific area developed over a long period, how the landscape impacted people and vice versa. This approach is sensitive in particular to the variety in which people attach meaning and also identity to heritage. Character sketches identifies a biography as a kind of DNA, a genetic code of a landscape, to inspire planning and time, to inspire the future. Now this approach indeed is fundamentally different from the sector approach, especially with regard to philosophy, ethics, and the role of heritage in society. Like with other approaches, we will take this approach, the biography, as a point of departure to link uh, to study, to operationalize, which mathematics and tools are needed to do so. However, <coughs> we hold that other avenues must also be explored to link heritage to heritage planning and design. And here I come back to my emphasis on critical reflexive and um, critical reflexive analysis of questions like how is heritage
is defined, being defined. Who decides? What are the social and political mechanisms and also implications of all this? Now, these are important questions. We think that the spatial heritage studies, such questions are often not asked, uh, only in a pragmatic, in pragmatic terms. Actually, character sketches explicitly acknowledges that the approach is pragmatic. For a now more profound, reflexive answer, we must turn to the so-called critical heritage studies, which is a line of research, critical heritage study, which is a line of research which has been developed from the 1980s under the influence of postmodernism. It is represented, amongst others, in the International Association of Critical Heritage Studies. They have conference, conferences every two years. <coughs> and whilst spatial heritage studies are linked, above all, with the spatial sciences, like, uh, like uh, planning, regional planning, and design, critical heritage studies, they tend to the social <coughs> science, to the social studies, and to critical field. They cherish the more contextual and constructivist, social constructivist approach, focusing on the making of marriage and on its use for social political goals. In this perspective, intrinsic value of heritage is questioned. Heritage is rather perceived as construction, linked to social order, to structures of power, and to domination, and to issues of social inclusion and exclusion. And subordination. Thus, landscapes, sites, and monuments, in this case, are, from this perspective, the subject of memorization or heritization. They are not heritage, but they are heritized as vital strategies in social, political, and economic processes, serving to establish, to maintain, to enhance or to contest power positions. Significantly, critical heritage scholars argue that the same line of reasoning goes for many present-day heritage strategies. Well, I mean, this is almost obligatory. According to Laura J. Smith, uh, heritage management is most commonly part of an authorized heritage discourse which feeds an unchallenged consensual view. The word consensual is very important. I'll come back to that. Consensual view of the past and the present. Moreover, according to Laura Jane Smith, this discourse quite often contrasts with heritage values of individual citizens, let alone of minority groups in society, considering that heritage is quite often indeed an instrument in national identities, minority groups. According to Laura Jane Smith, they uh, they often clash in that sense. Well, now, such criticism has also reached spatial heritage practitioners, judging from an increasing intention, intention to public participation and to citizen co-creation in this field. Clearly, the degree of civic participation remains a matter of debate. In most projects, it is limited to questionnaires asking about citizen values of, of predefined heritage objects, uh, but in the Netherlands, a more extreme position in this spectrum is taken by Imo Knoll and by uh, and Michiel Schwartz in their project. Three values, uh, in Dutch, which, uh, well, theirs is a social constructivist approach focused on stimulating local communities to produce and design their own heritage and their own living environment. Through engagement, through the English word engagement is not a proper term. It is an invitation, I think, for heritage, the uh, Limos and, and, and Michiel's um, uh, work, it's an invitation to heritage practitioners to reconsider, to reconsider their own role. Not so much as steering and controlling managers in an authorized heritage discourse, but as facilitators and mediators. Again, this is one of the positions in the discourse. I'm just pointing them out. From a critical heritage perspective, a series of other observations must be made 
which can also positively impact theory and practice in spatial patterns and strategies. First of all, uh, one may question what it means when, a, when biography of landscapes are interpreted as DNA, as a genetic code of specific local landscapes to inspire the future of that same landscape. Such an approach as has been uh, observed before, it can be criticized for creating a kind of an origin link, of course, sustaining historically rooted and geographically uh, circumscribed local identities. Moreover, a critical analyst perspective will also point out that people do not naturally interact with one single predefined landscape, but with a plurality of landscapes, from dwellings to neighborhoods to national to international landscapes and uh, to mindscapes as well. That this interaction is dependent also on social structures and on choices that can vary between localism and globalism, between conservative and innovative, depending also whether we deal with insiders or outsiders like immigrants. This may come closer to the original idea of the landscape biography as developed among other by Jan Korn. Another critical issue that can benefit spatial heritage studies is again linked to the social political sphere. Heritage planning in public space, here an example, tends to build consensus. Here we come back to the consensual approach and discussed by Laura Jane Smith. It tends to build consensus with images of golden ages and other positively very uh, valued heritage concepts. Think of the reconstruction here of a Roman castellum at Utrecht or Ruhr, I've been there with my kids. It's a fantastic playground, I must say. Uh, it neatly fits also in the Dutch canon celebrating national identity, in which the Roman present, the Roman Limes, has now been now almost, I think almost only, it has presented for the UNESCO World Heritage. But it ignores, of course, the more obvious historical relationship with conquest and imperial control. There's not much about that in the district. Or else, think of such former industrial landscape as in Essen, in the Ruhrgebiet. Fantastic what is, what is happening over there. Where an active policy of heritization of the former uh, mine, the former industrial areas has been employed However, one could observe from a critical perspective, it has been employed to neutralize the situation of social economic depression and inequality. Indeed, dark, unpleasant heritage, conflict, exploitation, or slavery are generally ignored or avoided accordingly. True, such problematic histories are increasingly being highlighted, especially in museums. I'm I don't have to explain, but this is the Trompe Museum in Amsterdam. I don't have to explain what we see here. This is a criticism, of course. However, this is not yet common in the field of spatial heritage planning. To come to a preliminary conclusion, um, I have emphasized the positive contribution that critical heritage studies can bring to the field of heritage and spatial development. Foremost, the invite to become self-reflexive and, uh, and also to question our strategies and actions in the context of the discourses and social structures that we have internalized and that we rarely are aware of, but indeed we can become reflect and conscious of that. They also help to read past strategies from a similar critical perspective and to highlight conflict, domination, and uh, inequality, for instance, in past. It's an opportunity, it's a possibility. Yet, it may be stressed, oh sorry, it may be stressed that critical heritage studies still often are limited to theory and deconstruction. And I think that such an approach risks risks alienation, alienation from the future, from the urgent challenges which modern society poses us. Think of multiculturalism. Think of climate change, think of democratization and digitalization, the issues that are vital, that we have chosen to be vital for heritage. 
And as a matter of fact, we hope that critical reflexive studies will much when they extend their scope beyond the present and beyond theoretical deconstructivism and engage in future-oriented analysis of key societal issues as they are indeed exploring now in the 2020 Conference of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies, which is exactly about the other heritage futures. Now, there are many ways to do so. One way is to broaden the concept of heritage, to integrate indeed the uncomfortable dark sides of history also in spatial and environmental terms. You can do so, for instance, by tracing the geography of you know, slavery in both trips on the Amsterdam canals. A colleague of us, Dean Cavendias, is strongly engaged in this kind of research, writing about the Amsterdam slavery heritage guide. You can do so also by investigating <coughs> chariotscapes, for instance, opening chariotscapes, and here I refer to Rob from the last project about chariotscapes, and he is, this is his line of research. Sites of conscious, conscious, or creating such sites, new heritage sites from the scratch, like the Berlin Holocaust Memorial, for instance. And, uh, or even calling attention to the heritage of the plastic zoo in the globe's ocean. There are indeed nowadays heritage researchers who do so. Another related way to answer the critical call, and that is feels unfamiliar, to abandon the concepts of conservation, restoration, and continuity, and the excessive fear of loss which incites them, which allows room for decay, abandonment, destruction, and more in general, change in society. In society and also in its spatial configurations. As a matter of fact, there is a whole line of new research which approaches loss and change as a challenge and an opportunity for the emergence of alternative values book curated a decay, for instance, by Hayden Disney or David Harvey on the future of heritage as climate changes. I'm coming close to my conclusion. All this clearly leads to a considerable widening of the field of heritage studies, wider even than in the vector approach that I've just discussed. And this brings me indeed to the end of my talk. And this Light. I would like to come back to Remus uh, in few chats. I think we are quite often on the same line. We observe that heritage discourses are gradually merging, uh, moving, sorry, moving far beyond tangible places or intangible traditions to become an all encompassing social quality. And this is exactly what I am out for. Key in my argument is the notion common throughout the social sciences and the humanities, that physical landscapes, the ones we see here, landscapes, sites and objects, just as histories, memories and traditions that go with them, are not only limited, uh, intimately tied up with human agency, uh, but also with social structures and systems of values and behaviors. Whether we now focus on structures as dominating or dominating elements like in Levi Strauss uh, structuralism, or emphasize on the other hand human agency as the motor of what is going on, that is the rational choice theory, <coughs> whether we try to bridge between the various elements by introducing uh, the concept of uh, habitus and practice of Bourdieu, uh, or whether we use Latour's actor, uh, actor network theory, holding that everything in this network is intimately related in, in a non-hierarchical way, nature or culture, in constantly shifting networks of relationship. I don't want to go into the details of the explanatory methods and theories. 
what specific theory to use is a matter of debate. But it is my firm conviction that these networks between people and material and immaterial items, social structures and, and cultural and systems of behavior and values, that these should indeed be the very subject matter of heritage studies. As a matter of fact, there is nothing to keep us from approaching them as heritage. Not in the sense of a stable, geographically defined, essentialized historical entity, but as a quality, fluid and dynamic, continuously in the remain. Analyzing them, the whole package, is vital to understand how communities are defined, how communities are, how groups are in and excluded, if we are interested in these objects and these things, of course. What heritage values are constructed and how, in these processes, landscapes are shaped, heritage landscapes are shaped, how they are used and eventually, <coughs> indeed, heritized. We have to understand what is going on here. How they are heritized by either governments or individuals. Such an analysis, I think, should not be limited, although this can be used for past and present analysis, but should not be limited to past and present landscape, but may extend also to the design of future ones, focusing on social, economic, or environmental needs and visions. And here, anthropologists are doing a padre can serve as a guide. Whilst the future is traditionally the domain of urbanists, planners, economists, Apadurai forcefully argues that it foremost is a cultural fact, meaning that also ideas and designs of the future are thoroughly entrenched and informed <coughs> by these social structures and the behavior and value systems that I've just discussed. To conclude, this is why Apadurai invites the social and cultural sciences to appropriate the future and to appropriate planning and designing as their field of study. And this is indeed the reason why in Maryland cultural and social and society, sorry, cultural and social scientists have joined urbanists architects, economists, and planners to bridge between past and future heritage landscapes in a critical, reflexive way. Thank you very much, and, and I'm now happy to introduce the author.